Well, when David asked me to speak on the emotions in the face of suffering, I don't think he realized that he was gonna have an emotional basket case up here. <laughs> oh my goodness. Tears were flowing as we were singing those worship songs behind the curtain. Isn't the Lord Jesus great? And I guess I'm a little emotional also because I was in bed all last week healing a stubborn pressure sore and I did not write the message that I hoped to. So I don't know what you guys are gonna get this morning, but <laughs> it's not what I originally planned, but that's okay. Most people think that living with quadriplegia is utterly overwhelming, and it is. I remember shortly after I broke my neck, I met a young man in rehab, and he told me that he had been in a wheelchair for eight years. And I looked at him aghast. Eight years? I mean, to me, eight weeks seemed to be impossible, but eight years? It was unimaginable to me, a teenager who still wretched at the thought of having to sit down for the rest of my life. But now here I've been living as a quadriplegic for almost 50 years. And I still look back and I think, God, how did I do that? How did I make it? How have I done it? After all this time, quadriplegia still seems impossible. About a month ago, I was um, writing to a young 17-year-old guy named Tommy who had recently broke his neck body surfing off the New Jersey shore. He's now a quadriplegic. And halfway through my letter to him, in which I was uh, listing several hurdles that he should expect as he goes through rehab, I had to stop. I just was so devastated by it all. What lies ahead for this young man? I've been there, I've experienced it, I know it. And so I just started sobbing over this letter. Oh God, how will this young man ever make it? How will he do it unless you help him? Tommy's facing the impossible. And I'm sure he feels like this portrait here. This is a copy of a drawing that I did, a self-portrait, shortly after I was injured. And to me, it captures all the horror, all the dread in that expression. It's so chilling. And when I drew it, what I was trying to convey was, oh God, this is now my life. It is a self-portrait, but it's also Tommy's portrait. I think it's any person's portrait who was facing a life-altering loss. Could be quadriplegia, could be paraplegia, could be brain injury. It could be a deep loneliness, a disappointment, mental illness, the loss of your dreams. When your child is born with significant multiple disabilities, something you did not expect, something you did not plan for, something you thought only happened to other people, but it's happening to you. And after the initial shock and denial and anger and the bargaining is somewhat behind you and the depressing reality of the quote new normal begins to sink in, you think to yourself, oh God, this is now my life. You all know my story, the story that came out of that anguished self-portrait and there is no need to explain to this group how God rescued me. In fact, some of the people who were very key and instrumental in rescuing me, God used, are sitting right here in this audience. As you well know, I've written books about it. But that self-portrait, that ghoulish anguish, is not entirely behind me. In 1998, my husband and I were in Holland where I was speaking at various churches and our Dutch friend, our host, had prepared this sumptuous dinner at his home and it was very elegant, china, silver, candlelight and halfway through dinner, I had to push myself away from the table, excuse myself 
explaining that I had to visit the restroom, but in fact, I had to quickly go lay down. I said to Ken, sobbing into his lapel of his jacket, I can't do this. I'm in such pain. That was the beginning of what has become a long and arduous and rigorous journey of dealing daily with chronic pain. I know it's hard to explain why a quadriplegic or how a quadriplegic could even feel pain. They call it something like pelvic obliquity. But that pain began to eat away at what little physical well-being I enjoyed as a quadriplegic. Pain in my lower back and in my left hip became all-consuming, robbing me of joy and robbing me of the ability to focus on anything. I would get up in my wheelchair in the morning and I would head to the office of Johnny and Friends. Our ministry is located out in Southern California. And upon my arrival, I would immediately go lay down in my office on a little office bed and try to do work from my bed. My life was on ultra so slow speed. My husband Ken and I tried to be reasonable about this and level-headed, and so we tackled the pain with what we thought was a level-headed plan. Went to hospitals, visited doctors, took blood tests, CT scans, MRIs, x-rays, homeopathic remedies, pain medication, you name it, all of that, nothing helped. And by 2007, the pain became jaw splitting. It made my quadriplegia feel like a walk in the park. I would dread the nights because I couldn't turn in bed to make myself comfortable, and I did not dare ask my husband Ken to get up one more time to retuck the pillows so that I might be comfortable. And lying there, I would dread the mornings because I knew that in the morning my pain would be worse. I would be stiff and sore. Every time I drove to Johnny and Friends down the 101 freeway, every single bump in the concrete was like a stab up in my back. And depression, dark, grim depression, something I had not felt in years, began to settle in like a constant low-grade fever. And, and by 2009, I cried out to God, Oh God, this is now my life. I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can handle pain like this. I could not believe how easily overcome I was by fears of the future that my pain might get worse. I mean, me, the one who lived by 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that God would not let any testing befall me for which he would not also give grace to bear it. But where was the grace for the totally unbearable? I could not believe that God honestly thought I could handle this, even with his grace. I was surprised and ashamed for feeling like that because I believed 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Oh my goodness, I believed 2 Corinthians 12, 9, that God's grace was sufficient. But this was something new. God was calling me out into waters far, far deeper than quadriplegia. Quadriplegia was way back in the shallows. No, I was now out in the deep end with uncontrolled pain emotionally dragging me under the water. My emotions took me down an even darker, more grim path. At the time, I was serving on a coalition in California to defeat a proposed assisted suicide law in our state. And my fellow disability advocate friends and I vigorously campaigned against it because as you all would well know, even though such a law might be written for the terminally ill, it jeopardizes people with disabilities. Like where is a disability? Stop becoming a disability and become a terminal illness. But when I would lie in bed at night and I was alone with my thoughts, I wondered if assisted suicide might not be a bad idea. I knew that my pain was under the governance of my sovereign God. It's just that now his sovereignty seemed so scary. 
And I was supposed to be a veteran at this disability of mine. I was supposed to be able to trust in his sovereignty. It had always been such a comforting doctrine to me all my many years in my wheelchair. I wondered how Jesus felt when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He shuddered, he trembled, he sweated and prayed that the gruesome cup might pass from him. He knew the cross was the Father's will, but I don't think that softened the foreboding horror of it all. Even when impaled on cross beams, Jesus, his emotions tumbled out, and he cried from his gut, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you think about it, the scene is emotional and so pathetic and pitiful. Yet at that very moment, Jesus had to know, he had to know that he was in the very center of his Father's perfect will. And as I mused on Jesus, on his cross, I realized I am also in the very center of my Father's perfect will. Even with this pain, even though my pitiful and, e and pathetic emotions insisted otherwise. The pain persisted until 2010, and there came a new twist. I got stage three breast cancer. Ironically, the very day I learned that news, I was sitting in the parking lot with my husband outside the oncologist office. The very day I learned that news, my depression lifted. Oh, merciful God, you are getting ready to take me home. I am so <laughs> grateful. I am so thankful. Hallelujah, here I'm coming. My depression also lifted for another reason. My focus was off pain now and entirely on battling this cancer. And I don't need to tell you, it was tough and rigorous. I had to go through a radical mastectomy and then I was in bed for quite a long time recovering. And then I was called into my medical oncologist office to discuss what my chemotherapy routine would be like. And I'll never forget, Ken was sitting next to me and we were in this tiny little office with the door closed and Dr. Ashori, that's his name, he was there with his clipboard listing all the things I would have to go through to prep me for chemotherapy. I would have to go back in the hospital, I'd have to have a, per, a port surgically inserted into my chest, I would have to be uh, prepped for taking highly toxic drugs, which would further weaken my already fragile quadriplegic bones. I would probably get a lung infection or something the matter. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> That's a great husband. <laughs> Gee whiz. <laughs> Don't know what was wrong, but that was okay. Anyway, I, 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 he, he just listed through this clipboard one thing after another, bam, bam, bam. Then the nurse called him out, he got up, went out the door, closed it, and I just, great heaving sobs. I said to Ken, I can't do this. I, this is enough, I cannot do this. I can't do this. Jeremiah chapter 12, verse five says, if you are worn out in a foot race against men, what makes you think you can compete against horses? My battle with quadriplegia for 50 years had been my foot race against men. But now, cancer, this was a, this was a battle against horses. And several people, good friends of mine, wondered out loud, God, why are you putting Johnny through so much? Cancer, on top of pain, on top of quadriplegia. But I always recounted to them, to this I have been called, as it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Because Christ suffered for me, leaving me an example 
that I should follow in his steps. It was a precious Bible verse that had seen me through many a hard time in years past. Could I follow in Christ's steps this time? Even if the Father's will had in it for me elements of foreboding horror? Yes, I told myself, Jesus is worth it. But how could I make my emotions feel it? That was the struggle, that was my challenge. I knew in my head, God is sovereign. Okay, okay, so his sovereignty might be scary, but I trust him. Why can't my emotions, emotions fall in line? One day, Ken was driving me home from the chemotherapy clinic, and we were heading down the 101 freeway in our van. I was in my wheelchair in the back, tied down, and he was in the driver's seat, and we were conversing with one another through the rearview mirror. And as we were talking, we started discussing how suffering is like little splashovers of hell, kind of waking you up and getting you thinking about the real hell from which Christ has actually rescued you from. And so then we started discussing on the way down the freeway, well then, what are splashovers of heaven? Our splashovers of heaven are days when there is no pain, days when the chemotherapy drugs aren't drying me out terribly. Our splashovers of heaven, easy breezy bright days when there are no medical bills, that the sun is coming up, the birds are singing, the sky is bright, everything is rosy on the horizon. Are those splashovers of heaven? And he pulled up into the driveway and turned off the ignition. I was still looking at him in the rearview mirror. And I said, no, no, I, I think that a splash over of heaven is finding Jesus in your splash over of hell. There's nothing more sweet than finding Jesus with you right in the middle of your hell. For me, that moment was an emotional turning point. It was as though my emotions finally got in line with my head and my heart and the word of God. It was an epiphany. Although I had experienced something similar when accepting my paralysis years, decades ago, this was not a repeat. This was seeing Jesus as I had not quite seen him before. In the early days of my quadriplegia, I was always comforted by um, Hebrews chapter four, verse 15. You know the verse well. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Back then, it helped to know that I had a savior who had been wounded with my miseries so that he might be my merciful high priest. He identified with me, he resonated with me, he was looking out for me, he was with me. But now, seeing Jesus as precious in my hell was a divine invitation to identify with him. Not so much him with me, but me with him, to see him, him suffering on the cross, to grieve over the sins that caused him such pain. And oh my goodness, I had been looking for my emotions to get in line with my heart. Suddenly I was filled to overflowing with this fresh adoration for my Savior. Seeing like Jesus like this was nothing that I had quite experienced before. It was like he was taking my hands and laying them upon his breast, letting me feel how his heart beat how his heart broke over the sin that caused the world's suffering. Best of all, this flip-coined perspective on Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, gave me a whole new fresh disdain, disgust for my own sin. 
And my first thought, oh my goodness, how dare I cling to the sins that caused such misery for my Jesus. Oh Lord Jesus, I'm gonna put complaining behind me. I mean, I, I, I don't wanna wake up in the morning anymore with a sour disposition, how am I gonna make it? Oh, this pain's so awful. What about new pain medication? Will there be something to help me? Forget it, Jesus. I love you, a fresh and a new. When we were singing worship songs a moment ago backstage, tears filled my eyes when we all sang together about the ransom church of God. Be saved to sin no more. Isn't it wonderful that we are being saved to sin no more and one day we shall be saved to sin no more. Forget the fears that I had about the future. For too long, pain had riveted my focus on myself, my agony, my anguish. But bless God for the cancer that he gave because it incinerated my self-focus and fixed my eyes on Christ. Thomas Merton wrote, in order to suffer without dwelling on our own affliction, we must think about a greater affliction and turn to Christ on the cross. In order to suffer without hate, we must drive out bitterness from our hearts by loving Jesus. In order to suffer without hope of compensation, we should find all our peace in the conviction of our union with Jesus. These things are not a matter of ascetic technique, but of simple faith. And in simple faith, I embraced my pain with willful, determined thanks, entering into it, no longer afraid of it, and trusting that God would make every particle of my suffering work in me a death to self. William Law once wrote, receive every inward an outward trouble with both your hands. Receive every darkness and desolation, every deep disappointment with both your hands as a blessed opportunity, as a blessed occasion of dying to yourself and entering into a fuller fellowship with your Savior. Look at no inward or outward trouble in any other view. Reject every other thought about it, and then every trial and distress shall become the blessed occasion of your spiritual prosperity. I would walk the bloodstained path to Calvary, breathing deeply, stretching often, drinking lots of water. That's my personal prescription for dealing with pain. I would walk the path called Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. I want to know Christ. Yes, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection, the kind of power that will help me put sin to death even further in my life. I want to know that power and the fellowship of entering into his suffering if it means that I can meet Jesus in my hell and become like him in his death. I want to take up my cross daily and die to the sins that he died for on his cross. From then on out, whenever I would go down the 101 freeway to work, Sure enough, the bumps would be there in the concrete. Sure enough, the pain would go stabbing up my back. But just recently, um, during one of those jaunts out to the, man, I wish they would repave the 101. <laughs> Gee. During one of those jaunts out to uh, Johnny and Friends' office, um, God gave me Psalm 119, verse 50. My comfort in suffering is this. Your promises renew my life. And so all the way down the freeway, I kept reciting out loud, because if I'm to be like Jesus in his death, he quoted scripture out loud on his cross, right? So I'm gonna quote scripture out loud. I'm gonna recite every promise I can think of, Lord Jesus. So I, I thank you for the promise that you are my ever-present help in trouble. Bang, goes the freeway. I, I, I thank you that, that you promise you'll never leave me or forsake me. I thank you that you you promise that in the book of Joshua that you will fight battles for me. I, 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 I thank you for the promise that your grace really is indeed sufficient. Bang, 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 all the way out to of the office. And when I arrived, I was so happy. 
I cannot tell you how happy I was. The power of the spiritual life, wrote Thomas Watson, depends exactly upon the degree of self-crucifixion. An interior crucifixion, he called it. Oh, the blessedness of being conquered, of losing strength and desires, and seeing only his. Friends, I don't know how to tell you this, but there came over me the most amazing indifference to my suffering. A kind of calm, sweet carelessness that enabled me to inwardly smile at my own affliction because it was there I could know Jesus better. I had been crucified with Christ. It was no longer I who was living, but Christ living in me. Some nights I would lie in bed in such terrible pain, yet I would be so glad. I would sing from my bed to an audience of one. Ever lift thy face upon me as I watch and wait for thee, resting neath thy smile, Lord Jesus. Earth dark shadows flee, brightness of the Father's glory, sunshine of the Father's face. Keep me trusting, resting ever, thine is full of grace. I could not keep this to myself. I had to reach out to others. Again, becoming like Jesus in his death, because what did he do on his cross? He was reaching out to others. Right there on his deathbed, what is he doing? He's counseling the apostle John. He's, he's, he's counseling his mother. He's giving instructions. He's giving wisdom, wise advice. He's, he's rescuing, he's mercifully reaching out to the thief next to him, even on Jesus' deathbed he reached out to others and we are called to do the same. I tell quadriplegics that all the time. I give them the example of Jesus. You think you, think you have it bad? You can still reach out to others. And that's what I did. I, I wanted to reach out to others in a new way, especially those who were living with intractable pain. Pain much more excruciating than mine. And so I began collecting all the emails and letters that had been coming into Johnny and Friends from people who were dealing with chronic pain I gathered about 35 people, most of whom I had never met, but most of whom lived with excruciating pain. Several of them bedridden for over a decade with incurable conditions, all of them stalwart saints. I even formed a private Facebook page called My Pain Pals. <laughs> and I tell you what, I was always so heartened, and I am still, so heartened and by the support and intercessions that they give not only me, but to each other. It became this glorious spiritual community, albeit an invisible one. And hearing their stories on this private Facebook page, and I just posted something a short time ago, they're praying for our time together this morning, my pain pals. They'll post things from scripture, they'll post things from Watson and Rutherford and Jeremiah Burroughs and Spurgeon and more, all of this helping me enormously as we help each other. And when pain would become excruciating, I would quickly confess my fear and my frustration to my pain pals or maybe to a friend. When I went to the Johnny and Friends office, sometimes I would have to lie down two or three times during the day to adjust my corset to get my hip in place. And I would cry out to my girlfriends, my coworkers, oh, please lay your cool hand on my head and pray for me, pray that I not fail, pray that I not falter, pray that I not shame my savior, that I not stain his reputation with complaining. Please pray for me. Oh my goodness, this beautiful transparency bound me so much closer to not only my pain pals on that Facebook page, but to my Christian friends, all because of Jesus and seeing him afresh. But for you counselors, how do you lead people to that point? How do you convince them that Jesus goes where no one else can go? As Piper recently said, he goes where no counselor can go, he goes where no doctor can go, he goes where no medication can go. And what about those whose suffering does not get fixed or solved or mended? 
how can they be made to see that Jesus is ecstasy beyond compare and that it is, as my friend Steve Estes told me years ago, worth anything to be his friend. Well, serving as many special needs families as we do at Johnny and Friends, I've learned that when you offer biblical truth to someone whose life is bleeding out of control, you don't offer it as though you were slapping a pint of life-preserving blood on a counter and saying to someone, here, here, believe this, take this life-giving principle, swallow it, ingest it, you'll feel better. No, no, no. That's not the body of Christ thing to do, is it? Rather, we do the more difficult, the more demanding thing. We walk that person with that person in their painful journey, hooking up our spiritual veins to theirs, as it were, and infusing into their hearts truth that will bolster their spirits as we carry their burdens and pray for them. It's counseling with compassion. You know that word. Calm means with, passion means suffering. With suffering, you counsel with suffering. You are with them in their heartache, and your healing presence shows them that the Lord Jesus, the most God-forsaken man who ever lived, says to them, I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. And then when they feel the pain of deep brokenness, they may well accept it as the sharp, painful wedge of God's will. And as you help the sufferer see his place in the body of Christ, he experiences what it means to fit, to be supported and sustained, to connect and resonate with others who suffer, to catch that fresh glimpse of Jesus. I experienced this when I was first injured back in 1967. Spiritual community made all the difference in my life. God bless Steve Estes and I don't know, I could list them all. Hal Pendergrass and Chuck Garriott and I don't know, uh, uh, so many people who made such a difference in my life. I'll, I'll never forget one time, uh, some of them, I don't know if Steve was in the group, but about 10.30 at night, we went down to the old Pennsylvania Railway Station off of North Avenue in Baltimore City because all of us like to sing and this was a wonderful place to sing. It had a high ceiling like this place, beautiful marbled columns, stone floor, a vaulted ceiling. You could sing and sound wonderful. It was gorgeous. And so our little group gathered over in a corner of the railway station. There wasn't anybody around at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. The place was virtually deserted and we started singing. But then an officious looking man with a badge on his chest, walked up to us and said, you kids, you see the no loitering sign up there? Get out of here, you don't belong here. And then he looked at me and said, and you, Missy, put that wheelchair back where you found it right now. <laughs> I said, but sir, it's, it's, it's my wheelchair. Don't give me any lip, you put it back right now where you found it. <laughs> but it's my wheelchair. I can't remember who helped me into bed that night but one of my friends said, Johnny, I want to thank you. That's the first time I heard you call it my wheelchair. To own your weakness, to call it my affliction, to take responsibility in it. That's what spiritual community does. When caring friends surround you and give you biblical truth, as it infused into your heart through their veins into yours. And when it happens, you are well on your way to emotional healing. It happens all the time in spiritual community in the body of Christ. God never intended that we should suffer alone. Comfort and healing occur in spiritual community and isolation will always spell death. That's why our ministry is so heaven bent on getting churches to reach out to people with disabilities because they are so isolated. They are relegated to back bedrooms, but healing comes through relationships. When you're depressed, the best advice I always give is get up tomorrow morning and take a shower and get dressed. Open your front door, walk out, and go serve somebody in your community in the name of Jesus, somebody who's hurting worse than you are. That is what the Christian walk looks like walking on the blood-stained road 
to Calvary. The Christian life was never meant to be lived isolated. It was meant to be lived in support with other brothers and sisters in Christ. It was never meant to be one of comfort and ease and good health. And you can't do your counselees a better service than to help them grasp that important fact. G.K. Chesterton once said, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting, it has been found difficult and untried. God wired this world to be difficult. It is filled with quadriplegia and cancer and pain. And when I wheel into the office every single morning when I work at Johnny and Friends, there on my office wall is a wonderful photograph of a guy from Africa, a man who fell out of a tree, broke his back, became paralyzed. He laid there for six hours until finally friends found him and his family dragged him back home and there he sits in his home in intractable pain. And I look at him and every day, no matter how badly my back hurts or my hip, I look at him and I think, oh my goodness, Johnny, today you were gonna squeeze every ounce of ministry effort that you can possibly squeeze out of your paralyzed body to serve people like him. There are more than one billion people with disabilities in the world, 80% of whom live like he does. And I wanna make a difference until the day God calls me home, no matter how challenging my own physical circumstances, I have to serve others. And so must you. So get up, get dressed, go out the door tomorrow morning and find somebody else who's hurting worse than you are and make a difference in their life. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse 10, should be every Christian story because we are sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, having nothing, but yet possessing everything. Poor, but making many rich. We gain by our losses, we live by dying, and we become full by emptying ourselves. And oh, what a crown awaits us. A crown for those who suffer, and for those who come around and support and help them. My pain still persists, but I've learned how to die to it, as well as to a great many other things. As I look back on over 50 years, try as I may, I cannot now recall the horror of it all. The many hospital stays, the surgeries, the accident, pain, cancer. I cannot even recall how awful it felt lying in bed for a full week last week. Grace keeps softening the edges of awful things, choosing only the highlights of eternal importance. And what I'm left with is peace that is profound, joy that is unshakable, and faith that keeps reaching out to my beautiful Savior. It is the hard but beautiful stuff of which God makes a sufferer's like. Like, when did that happen? How did I get here? How did I do it? I cannot say. But what I can say now with a smile is, oh God, this is now my life. God bless you, and thanks for listening.